all this. Hey! Yes. <laughs> Coach. Coach, you're giving me a heart attack over here. No, it's just, look, it's uh, a lot of followers waiting on a, a boomer. <laughs> Did you figure it out? Okay, is this your first Instagram Live? It's kind of exciting. Yeah, absolutely it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here's how it works. It's live, so be, that, that's your one warning. And there's a lot of crazy comments. I probably wouldn't pay attention to them if I were you. But that's just my pro tip uh, for you. How are you? I'm good. Uh, another nice day. I'm in Florida, actually, right now. I've been here for quite a while. And last week, they just opened the beaches. So, um, and it's not crowded at all. I mean, it, people are spread out. Um, it's a good place to be uh, if if you're having to just be isolated. Mm, and you, of course, can't be with your team, so that's sort of weird. Can you take me inside a Zoom meeting that you guys are having or a team meeting? Because I have to tell you, I had Emmanuel Sanders on my Instagram Live, and I don't know that you guys have even sat down together or anything, and he told me that he would run through a wall for you after the first meeting. So what are you doing in there? He was gushing. Well, listen, um, it's kind of unusual. There's a free agent like Emmanuel, and I haven't met him yet. And, you know, um, we've had probably two or three meetings, most of the time to check in, any updates. Um, you know, all of these guys are spread out. They're all kind of now getting into a workout routine, if you will. Some of them uh, needed some equipment or maybe some small ticket items to, to help them with their training. Um, and – for the for the rookies, it's different. We're in, you know, we're doing daily class sessions. For the veterans, though, I'm really just having them focus on getting in shape, taking care of their families. We had one today, and today's was a little different. Though we had a guest today uh, last week, and obviously we, there were four different players in our league uh, that ran into trouble. Uh, and as a coach, just like a parent, you're always preaching, you're always telling them to make good decisions. Yeah. And so Snoop came on. Our web I'm sorry, Snoop D-O-double-G came on your Zoom? Yeah, th that West Coast Snoop was on was on our Zoom, and he was a special guest. He, he was outstanding. And, uh, you know, he spoke a lot about just the difference between an athlete and an entertainer and understanding the athlete's role relative to a league, to a bigger picture, to a team, uh, to a league office, to an ownership group, whereas an you know, entertainer is really just his brand himself. And uh, so he, he helped with that message. It, it was uh, it was pretty good. And, and look, I couldn't read all the comments, but we had 114 people today on our team meeting and uh, he did a fantastic job. So what do you mean the comments like the in the in the players chat, you know, right away. And it, it's just funny when a recognizable figure like that joins the discussion and you're just like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty so, amazing. Thanks. Snoop Dogg, yeah, that's, not, that's not bad. Hey, what's the biggest challenge for you as this coach who wants to, you know, I'll always preach and always be involved. What's this, uh, the COVID-19 struggle that you know a lot about personally, of course, having overcome it. And thank you for donating plasma like you do and being such a great example. What is the biggest challenge for you that you're facing right now? I, I think, and, and it's not unique just to the Saints, but I think it's, there's a lot of incomplete work relative to um, players' physicals, um, free agents that we've signed, rookies that we've drafted. Um, I, I think we've done a good job of bringing the rookie class together, um, but trying to get them up to speed. I mean, we felt during the draft that this was going to be a year that would be challenging for a rookie player who maybe didn't learn as quickly as some others because, you know, he's missing, call it a semester or a spring of work. Um and then I think me personally, I, I kind of like being around people and I like going to work and being around other coaches yeah. and being in that environment where you're around your peers and I'm kind of like a creature of habit. I, I like a schedule, all those things. And this, you just have so much quiet time and time to think. Um, and it, it forces you to try to, put together a plan. Um, and there's a ton of requests for, hey, can you give our graduation a shout out? Can you do? Yeah. And, and I feel like like that's homework. And all of a sudden, I've got to make a list and check these boxes off. And so I think just dealing with that that silence and, and that, the lack of interaction, if you will, that, that's been a, a big challenge. 
So did you have to go in there and be like, hey, everybody, this is Jameis Winston, and then Jameis, like, introduced himself and talked? What was that like? Well, we handled it a little differently. My, one of my tech video guys, we, we kind of just put the pictures on a screen of all the uh, – of all the new players. And it's hard with, you know, it's hard with a hundred and some people on. You certainly, all of us, I think, have become better listeners because there's that delay in communication. And, but yeah, we put the pictures up with the new players. I haven't done that yet with the rookies because I, I just don't, I don't want them to get the abuse right away, like their first WebEx <laughs> meeting. <laughs> so I, I don't want it to be like Animal House. That's nice. Um, Can I see you coach? So I, I, yeah, I think uh, I think the players have handled it pretty well. I mean, I, I think they're very. All these guys are, are guys that will adjust and adapt. Um, and look, we went through this in 2011 a little bit. There was a lockout. It was a different challenge, a much different challenge. But I think the the, the future challenge for us, and and we're all waiting on the league schedule. And I, I think there's a lot of people discussing, you know, what's going to happen at the start of the season. Um, and then all of us, all 32 teams are quickly going to, you know, get up to speed with those challenges and, and get ready to go. I think we are going to play games. I think the bigger question would be whether we're playing in front of a live audience. How big of an advantage do you have, though, because you and Drew are so connected and have such chemistry, whereas you look at the NFC East, you look at a team in your division in Tampa Bay that's getting so much hype and they haven't had that chemistry, those reps, they're doing it in limited over the phone, over FaceTime. So it's not easy. So how big of a, an advantage do you have going into whatever this looks like? Well, look, I think um, I think we have a veteran team, an experienced team. Um, and I think when we went through this in 2011, we, we discussed this topic. Uh, I, I think it to some degree can benefit uh, a veteran coaching staff and team that's been together a while. Um, but I did happen to notice uh, a Tampa Bay practice in a high school just two days ago. Yeah. And I, I was, I was proud of the Tampa Bay parks department for kicking Tom <laughs> out of the, the recreational field. Are you sure you didn't, you didn't make that phone call coach? That was well, you. listen, I, I've, I've got it on speed dial, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I think, uh, I think, I think it does, I, it does help the, the teams that have been together. Um, obviously training camp, uh, will be uh, like it always is really important. I think the health and in reducing injuries as the early part of training camp takes place is going to be important because you've missed some time. Yeah, love that. Coach, we all know you're a Jordan guy. So I have to ask you, in these Zoom meetings, have you brought up the last dance yet? Or are you thinking about how you're going to execute, how I am sure the last dance affected you personally? Yeah, look, I and you're from Chicago, but I grew up with that. And remember, I was a sophomore in college when he got drafted and can remember so many of those games. And yet when you watch this series and it just ended and I kind of watched it religiously, you know, two episodes a week, there were so many things that came up that I either had forgotten or maybe was unaware of. And so I thought it was fantastic. Uh, and, and there were, man, there were so many things as a coach that you look at and recognize you know, the greatness of those teams. And then obviously uh, the, the, the individual accomplishment by Michael himself. Um, but no, this, this past off season, Mike Thomas is one of our Jordan brand yeah. representatives. Oh, and he, yeah. He wears a size 13, which is the same size shoe that I wear. Oh, that must be nice. Yeah. So we've always kind of had a little deal. Um, you know, if he gets a good touchdown pass or a good play in the red zone, the next week, there'll be a pair of 13 Jordans, and, and we, we just have fun with this. But they keep coming, and then during the Super Bowl, Michael just built a course down in Florida, and I had a chance to tour it um, and, and really look at – it's brand new. Uh, it's an invitational club, and, man, it, it, was, it, was, it was something else. And he was just finishing around, and I'd never met him, and the first thing he said was, you, you know, you're wearing Jordans on game day. You met him. Huh? I did. I did. I did. And look, we get numb doing what we do. We're around people that are celebrity, if you will, whether they're actors or athletes. Uh, and we never take that for granted. And yet it was certainly for, for me, it, that, that's kind of a different level. But he said, I'm going to make you my first Jordan coach. And I was kind of like, huh? And 
sure enough, two weeks later, I get this email and, uh, yeah, so it's, it's jump man right now. And, uh, I didn't put so any on. How do you guys maintain? I know. We, we know. We know, Coach. No. Um, it, it, are you guys like, fr- like, have you smoked like a stogie with him? Like how close? Are no. You? No. Have you? I've, just okay. met him, I've met him a couple times. He's been okay. real gracious, real friendly. Um, That's amazing. And I, I can't imagine his step. What's that? I would lose my mind. I could, probably couldn't talk if I met him. That's the Chicago. Yeah, I couldn't. I'd be like, uh, no. Um. <laughs> What was the biggest takeaway from the last dance for you? Um, just the, 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 the confirmation on things you believe as a coach, the unique characters on a team that come together. And even when you're watching some of the, and it's not by any means chaos, but when you're watching the grind, and it's not easy, and you're watching the accountability of teammates, and and you're watching someone like Phil manage that, manage Dennis, Scotty, uh, some of the ownership challenges. Um, it's exhausting to win, but it makes you. Whoa. It makes you appreciate what the Bulls have done because just the ability to to come back and it's different in basketball a little bit, but to come back the next year, the next year and, uh, and they're playing however many games. I mean, that's, it's, it's pretty impressive. The mental toughness to win. Love that. So true. If you guys have any questions for old coach, let us know here, uh, down here, keep it positive people. Coach, it's your first Instagram live. Do you know what TBT is? I don't. Throwback Thursday. And I have a throwback Thursday for you, if you will indulge me. I will. I had such a fun time just digging into your past this morning, Coach. Can you please, this is, you you need to get an Instagram because this is the best thing I have ever seen. Oh, yes. This is not the Super Bowl year in 85 or the year after, but right after that, you grew up in Chicagoland. You were the quarterback of the Chicago Bears. Oh, you don't like what? You're not into that? <laughs> Look, for, for me, it brings up, um, I don't say bad memories, but scary memories, because growing up as a Bears fan, we all saw Mike Dicka on the sideline. And we saw his personality, and it was it was so strong. And so all of a sudden, right out of college, uh, you know, having an opportunity to play during that season, and it was uh, be a, a different season. Yeah. Man, I was I was scared to death of him. That's the that's the persona he that that. Because look, we were fans, and now all of a sudden he's yelling at you, and I'm like, man, he is yelling at me. And uh, so that was challenging. Wait, so, but I mean, just for, why did you wear 17, first of all? I have like so many questions about this. Why, who, how'd you pick that? No one's picking when you're a free agent from Eastern Illinois. So you just go to your locker and you shut up and you just like, oh, I like 17. That's perfect. Thank you. Really? I mean, I'm just like, there's so, who's, who's this guy blocking you? Like, who's this little man over here? That looks like a receiver. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. One of the Stoops brothers was on that team. Um, yeah, I got a hit in one game, and and the first thing to hit the ground was the back of my helmet. And our last game was against the Saints, and my last pass was intercepted by the New Orleans Saints. Wow. And I never, I never played again. And then years later at some – Hall of Fame local deal in New Orleans. I met the player that hit me, and I met the player that intercepted my pass. And these guys are, you know, my age now. But yeah, that was it. Was a short career. Are you telling me that Mike Ditka did not have one fuzzy moment the entire time you were there? Man, I, I'm sure there was some fuzzy moments, but the other ones are the ones that um, that outweigh the fuzzies, you know, and. I can remember, look, I can remember the first time. All right, so that, that was back in, call it, 87. I can recall years later 
meeting him for the first time. Now I'm a head coach, really, and he's working for ESPN. I, I can recall that. And it was at the Super Bowl where the Cowboys, or excuse me, Dallas was hosting Green Bay and Pittsburgh 2010. Okay. And Mike was working for ESPN. And years later, I'm a head coach, and I still felt the same exact way. Is really? I felt on the set. Yes, nothing had changed, and um, yeah, it, it was it was. Uh, so, how does that influence your, you as a coach? How did that experience, which clearly affected you one way or another, for good or for bad, did any of that influence you? Yeah, I, look, parts of it. It wasn't a long period of time, but there were parts of it that you saw. You know, he, in a lot of ways, was like Parcells that he he would wear his emotions on his sleeve, and he was very comfortable in confrontation. And so the air was always cleared, whether it was what you wanted to hear or not, it, it still cleared the air. And Bill is that way. I mean, Bill's very much that way. So years later, as a young assistant coach in Dallas, when I'm working with Bill for the first time, I'm seeing a similar type version uh, of that style and and recognizing some of the benefits. And yet, I think one of the, one of the most important things – that we all have to do constantly is pay attention to what is our style and not try to be someone else. But it, it helped me to learn to confront better because, you know, part of that's how we're raised. And I was raised in a household. We didn't talk about a lot of things. It, you know, it was just a more of an old fashioned yeah. conventional, conventional household that, you know, we weren't sharing. I love yous every night at the dinner table. And so Man, when you're with Bill or you're around Mike, you're getting an East Coast in your face. Yeah. This is how I feel. And, and at first, it's real awkward, and then you get used to it. Huh. So I, I asked that because I feel like you're so different, and I don't know what goes on in that locker room or in those practices or after the game or before, but I know what I see as being a person who focuses on all 32 teams. You guys are so fun. Like, Camaro with airheads and Mark and Alvin in the locker room doing a co press conference post game and you with the money, the cash money that you would bring in or the Chapa style dancer, all of that. What percentage, if I was to like translate Sean Payton into a coaching pie chart, what percentage of your style would you say is fun or keeping it fun? I think, I think there's a percent. I think there's um, two pizza slices. Okay. Yeah, I think the I Chicago think, guy reference. I like that. Good. Yeah, two two deep dish pizza slices, which is a <laughs> lot more than than the normal <laughs> slice. I think I think our our athletes are much the same. I mean, I mean, I hear this all the time. They are the same, but they learn a little differently because they're they're learning in a much different fashion today. They're so much more visual, and so if if we started a meeting in '06 and '07 with just a an overhead, and you know five coaching points on it or bullet points, you know, in 2020, that same meeting might start with a video and a creative way to grab their attention. We're still teaching. Uh, and, and it's still, it's still a game about precision. It's still a game about execution, but the presentations changed over the years. And yet the messages are just brought to you in a different fashion. Mm, I like that. I just feel like you, you guys, you can view balance professionalism and obviously execution and just having fun. And I think that's something that I feel like, I feel like there's a lot of teams in the NFL and I like them all that are, they're just scared. It's like, they're scared to have fun. They're scared to have a good time. I, I think one of the great things about my job and our job is it's like, all right, you can't be in the locker room anymore. No one wants you to play anymore. And then you're like, oh, I have to go home or maybe I could coach. I'd like to coach. There's something about that locker room and there's something about um, being around young athletes that are committed, that are like fantastic at the top of their profession. And being a part of that, I think keeps you young. Yeah, I mean, and, I've seen you dancing in that locker room, coach. We've all seen you dancing in the locker room. Well, <laughs> like, like, here's the deal. We watched this documentary you were just discussing and you'd think that everyone on the team was going on and on about the last dance. And I'm looking at birthdays and they're not matching – these series wins that the Bulls are having. I'm like, you guys weren't even born yet. Yeah. And, and, and so 
like I was wearing the first pair of Jordan threes. I'll never forget it. You know, and a, and a hundred and twenty five dollar tennis shoe was like in our household, like that was, oh my, it was it, you couldn't get it until you went to college. Like you couldn't, and you would hide them from your parents because you wouldn't want my father like asking me how much those cost. Right. <laughs> I love that. If you guys have any questions for Coach, let us know down here. I have a tough one for you. What is your favorite play call? of your entire coaching career, not as a Saints head coach. Let's go back. Include Saints, include Dallas, include the Giants. What's your favorite play call? Favorite play call. Hard. It, I asked the tough questions, coach. Yeah. It, look, there's one that we put together that was so long. I'm telling you, it, it, it's only going to be a play we could run if Drew was in the game. So if something happened to Drew and the time comes when Drew's finished playing, this call we would never try making again, and, and it was like, uh, it was like trips right, zebra left, and we ran slash thirty seven. We kill sixty three sucker. It was one of these that just went so long, and it was almost comical. And then it became like, you know, Drew for him it was a challenge. Like, all right, I'm going to have this, and I'm like, yeah. no, let's listen, let's just call this something. So we will periodically come up with the team we're playing. So it's easy to say, oh, we're playing the Buccaneers. We'll call this Buck. Okay. But we've actually gone to ownership. So we've had, we've had an Arthur Blank and we've had a, <laughs> uh, a Jerry Richardson. All right. And the Jerry Richardson didn't last long. And, and so he's, he's no longer the owner of the Carolina Panthers, but we've used like in a meeting at two in the morning and you're trying to come up with, all right, let's come up with one word that everyone will be able to resonate with. And so these team names, are used all the time in different – so that a lot of times you can't use those. So, yeah, we'll grab, like, a, an ownership or – we'll think of something. But, um, yeah, I would say that real long sucker left – I can't even remember the name of it. Yeah. But it's, on, so, it's one of those – So, if Drew, were to, if Drew were to ever retire, then who do you think would be able to do that? Would it be Taysom or would it be James? <laughs> okay, no, no, no. That's what we're getting ready to figure out. And what do you mean? Well, when that time comes, I think there's been a lot of questions about that. My son even would ask, like, hey, I we think Taysom Hill is going to be a, a fantastic NFL quarterback, and yet we've only been exposed, most people have only been exposed to what we see him do in special teams or playing receiver or occasionally playing quarterback. And But we've had a chance to see a lot more than that, so we're privy to that. Yeah. And, we also think Jameis Winston is someone who just four years ago was the first pick of the NFL draft. Yeah. I, I was right behind him for the NFL. I, I watched his workout five yards away. Wow. And I think he's got, at age 26, a real bright future. And so we're in that quarterback business. And when that time comes, I think we just increase our chances by finding the right guy. He, both of those players know that they're going to have to beat out competition and that they have different skill sets and yet um, we're excited to work with both of them. That's a great coach answer right there. And we <laughs> missed Teddy too. I mean, listen, we were fortunate to have Bridgewater a year ago. Yeah. That was, it was a great room. I mean, we, yeah. when you looked at Breeze, Bridgewater and Taysom Hill, I mean that, you know, you, you might go 10, 15 more years before you, you have another group of three like that. So we were fortunate. Are we getting you in Tampa Bay week one? In New we Orleans? Do, we do play Tampa Bay week one. Um, it's the afternoon game in New Orleans. Okay. Are you excited about that one? Is that going to have a little extra something on it? Because you turn on Good Morning Football, we talk about is Tampa Bay. Yeah, that's okay. You, that's, on, you, you guys, turn on every station, it's just Tampa Bay. I got it. I got it. I. The one little thing that's kind of this, if we're playing games without the fans, it's like that first meme is that is the two crickets just sitting there rubbing their rub, rubbing their legs, and you're like, man, that is going to be different. Now, certainly the networks will be creative. In in you've already seen where Fox has talked about maybe piping in music or piping in fan, uh, crowd noise, but that impact packs us a, a little bit because I think we're one of those places that's hard to play, and, and so there's a few teams like Seattle or Kansas City yeah. that look at that as uh, and. It'll just be uh, – look, it'll be a unique experience for everyone. And, uh, yeah, Tampa week week one, though, and 
we want to quiet the cannons. That's what that's what I text Tom. I said hashtag like keep the cannons quiet. You te you texted Tom Brady that? Yeah, we will have a fun little. Yeah, but we, we we've known each other for years. What does he write back to that when you send him that? Oh, he laughs. He says, you guys are the favorite. We're the underdogs, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know. if you think about it, they've never really – when has Tom really dealt with that? When has Tom really dealt with the Saints team in his division? Nope. Listen. Just for a minute. Yeah. He, listen, he's a great competitor. And they were talking about this subject today. And I do think this. Immediately, immediately the bar is raised there with his presence, and, and that's something special, and, and it's something we saw in this Jordan documentary, that um, it's, there's no, I mean, were we surprised at all? There was an organized workout, and everyone was paying attention and focused at a you know, school somewhere, well within the rules, and that, that's, that's the beginning, and I'm sure for him, you know, a new challenge, just like it will be for, for those folks in, in New England, uh, Bill and his staff and that team will put together their best team and that's what uh, that's what makes this league fun. That, that's certainly right. I was going to ask you about play calling and your favorite. I mean, I, I assume the onside kick and you know the Super Bowl is your favorite thing that's ever happened. Actually, look, my favorite thing that ever happened was when the clocks ticked zero and we won that game. But when we actually when we actually kicked that, we expected a much cleaner. Like we expected to recover the ball. Had, had I have known that that was going to be like a three-minute pileup with white jerseys and blue jerseys, there's no way. Because if you do something like that, you want the odds to be better than 50-50. You, you, right. you, you, you feel like, man, it's a surprise. You feel like they should be tilted in your favor. And we felt Hank Basket was leaving a little early on some film cut-ups we saw. And Hank actually played, played it pretty well. It just bounced off his chest. But we almost made a bigger mistake. And at the end of the half, we, we knew we were going to be kicking off. And the officials mm -hmm. just grabbed me and they said, which way do you want to go to start the second half? And the wind was blowing a little bit left to right. And we hadn't really scored in the first half. And I felt like we needed to score. So we took the wind left to right and then got into the locker room. And it's 30, 35 minutes and made that decision. And by the time I was coming out, I remember talking with Solomon Wilcox on the sideline and looking at the official spot in the ball and realizing that that kick was going to be over on the Colts sideline. And we didn't, I didn't want that. I, you know, in other words, it's human nature. It's good. I want that to be on our bench, not their bench. And so I sprinted, I stopped from Solomon right away and I sprinted out and I said, I want to go right to left. <laughs> they said, you said left to right. Well, they don't really care. They'll change it. So they quickly flipped everything around. And then uh, gradually, you know, we lined up and kicked it, but it almost went the wrong way. That is crazy. What happens when you see Peyton Manning? What's that react? What's that interaction like? Are you guys friendly? Uh, yeah, he's a good friend. His his parents live probably eight blocks from where I live, wow. uh, in in the Garden District. And occasionally, uh, our paths will cross. Peyton, um, oh, I think the last time we were in training camp, and he was he was doing a a speaking engagement, but. Yeah, I have a ton of respect for him. He, he, listen, he was uh, – his career was amazing. Um, and then you, Eli – You changed his legacy, though, a little bit. You really did, and yours, and, of course, Drew Brees's. But, I mean, it's – you took something from Manning that that night, that day. Well, look, it was a, it was a, it was a unique game in that, really, the first half, I would say, momentum-wise, st statistically speaking, they, they really uh, – won the first half. And then the second half, you know, we started moving the ball a little bit better offensively. And then obviously the, the turnover by Tracy Porter was a big play in the fourth quarter. Um, the one thing I'm going to go back to the Jordan documentary, you know, when in those basketball games and the best of fives and the best of sevens, um, you, you, you get the sense they're always going to arrive at the best team by the end of that. And, in, in our postseason, which makes it very exciting, man, it's the team that plays the best in, in that three-hour period. Yeah. It, because it's just, it's just final. You know, there's not a let's regroup and get ready for game two or get ready, you know, where. And so I think in the second half, uh, we were fortunate enough to, to really switch the momentum. Do you think about the Super Bowl every day? No. 
Really? I think about the next one. Okay. Good answer. Yeah. Uh, so I did some research on you. I thought you were from Chicago, from Naperville, but you had moved there. You were born in San Mateo, which I thought was sort of interesting. And people always say, oh, Miami, Liberty City, there's something in the water, or Texas in football, there's something in the water in Texas. I want you to tell me, who has better NFL drinking water, Eastern Illinois University or San Mateo County, California? I'll lay it out for you. Eastern, yeah, I know, I know where you're Provo, going. Shanahan. Uh, Garoppolo, San Mateo, Brady, Edelman, Austin, Hooper, and you. Yeah, I know where you're going. Um, so I was only six. I was seven when I moved from San Mateo. But our house was like four blocks away from where Tom grew up. My older brother went to high school there. Um, you know, that's I, I believe Barry Bonds went to high school there. Uh so I don't remember a lot about San Mateo, but but I do remember my dad taking me to the Giants games in Candlestick or taking me to see a 49ers game, and it was much different. So that was my first exposure, and that was the old 49ers. That was John Brody. That was Gene Washington. It was an entirely different team. Okay. Um, but I, look, I'm going to be by The Eastern Illinois thing is pretty unique, I think. Right. Um, yeah, I, I call that home only because I think I was seventh grade when I moved there. I went to high school there, went to college there. And that's where uh, I've got a lot of good friends to this day. Um, but it, look, it, at that time, I think it was ten or 11,000 students that went there. And um, Mike Shanahan was the first. I remember when I was recruited hearing about Mike Shanahan and thinking that was a big deal. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah and Mike was a, a quarterback there as well. Um, yeah, so that I don't know if it's the water. Um, I, I definitely give any water discussion to San Mateo, though, over Eastern Illinois. So, okay. water. I mean, the goat, and one of the goats right here uh, from from San Mateo. Hey, we we had showed this play on Good Morning Football this week, and I I cannot get it out of my head, and I just want you to talk me through it and give me your vantage point because I don't see you in this video. I think I see you right next to a referee, so we'll talk about it. It's the meet jump. It is the cr coach. It is the craziest thing I have ever seen happen on an NFL, NFL field ever. It's you. It's the Redskins. It's 2009, I think. Yeah, it was. Oh, it is no. 2009. Yeah. It was third and 26. Drew Brees is just trying to make something happen, and. Everybody knows this play, but well, I mean, by the way, this is going on sweet stiff arm right here in five, four. Yes, Drew. Love this. Taking the ball all the way and running it back. This is like an insane situation. Talk me through where you are. So I remember the play. I remember it extremely well. Um, it was third and long, and, and Drew does have that kind of flush from the pocket. It was almost like he escaped like Eli did in that Super Bowl throw. Uh -huh. But this, at this point in the season, I think we're 7-0, 8-0, 6-0, 9-0. We were unbeaten. And, you know, things just begin to happen, and confidence comes from, you know, past experience, successes. And so this was one of those other plays that you just said, man, this was such a good – play to put on film and just talk about hustle um, because we're losing this game. We're going to lose this game. And this was something that just gives us a chance to get back in the game. I believe the game then goes into overtime and we win late. And it, it was, you, you have to know Robert Beecham. He's one of the most quietest kids on your team. He's not a kid, but just quiet, soft spoken. Okay. But, you began to believe, every one of those players began to believe on any play they could be the difference. And that's the thing, that's the hard thing is with 65 plays on offense and on defense and then the special teams, like how do you know it's not that play? Like tell me when you figure out how to turn it on and off. Like it can only, it can only be on because that was an example of it. And uh, I remember the bench went crazy because that – Coach, where were you? Were you standing by the ref? Were you I, talking to the ref already? I might have been yapping. I don't know. I might have been mad at Drew for throwing the interception. I can't even see yeah. where I'm at. No, I think you were standing by the ref, which means you were not happy with whatever was going on. But at what point did you realize Meacham has it? Were you even were you looking? Were you there? Yeah. I, I, the first thing, when anything good happens like that, this is me, and I think a lot of coaches are this way. The first thing 
we look at whenever there's a big scoring play, you just look for some like material on the field to make sure there's no flag. Uh, yeah. So and then you big. ask, yeah, you ask upstairs, is there a penalty? Like almost like you, you thought you saw one. Is there a penalty? <laughs> and everyone's <laughs> Before like, Before you get excited. Yeah, no one saw a penalty. All right, then. Uh, name something crazier than this you've ever seen happen on an NFL field. Um, this is tops for me. I've never seen anything crazier. Yeah, listen, before. that one. Uh, well, look, honestly, it 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 was the Minnesota play. I mean, that was crazy. Oh yeah, that it, that was like you know you were like thinking about like what you're going to tell your team after that big win and how they're going to have and all of a sudden that this pass takes place. And it happens on the far sideline. So, you know, you never know, like, is, is he out of bounds? Like, all you see is Diggs running, and you're thinking, there's no way. Um, I can think of it, you know, fortunately, we've been on the good side of some of these things, you know, where, man, you, you score late, you get an onside kick, and you score again. I can recall the, the win against Washington at home where, like, quickly, let's get in the locker room and put the showers on so the officials can't make us come back out on the field. We were down 15 points with like a minute and two minutes. I don't even know how many. We And Drew took us down, scored. We scored again, two-point conversion, tied it, went into overtime, won, and, and it was like, what just happened? Mm. But single play, that was definitely one of them. Um, you know, there's been some funny ones where the kickers end up with the ball running around. But I, I would agree, that, that was such a good effort play that um, that's up there. Do you think about the Stephon Diggs play more than the Super Bowl win? I don't think about either, really. I mean, look, I'll think I'll think about the missed call against the Rams more than any of them. Because that's a minute and a half away from being in the Super Bowl against Atlanta. So I'll think about that uh, in a negative light ten times more than those other topics. That's okay. You'll get there this year. We'll see you in Kansas City. <laughs> we will. We, we will. Oh, we will. Uh, did you bring something for show and tell? Yeah, I have show and tell, but I'm going to move this a little bit. Okay. If I can, I'm going to walk downstairs. You're crushing it, Coach. Your first Instagram live, and now you're going to do a walk and talk? Well, so I was impressive. late getting on. I didn't know how to get on. You're crushing it. Yeah, show us a little. Give us that MTV Cribs, a little uh, peek at the old uh, Florida mansion. Okay, yeah, well, so we're we're in. I'm gonna try to do my best. We're in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. Okay. And I'm you know sure what that? Pool. You gotta you show us the pool. You know what that's home to? No. Is that yours? Ooh. It is home to the makers of Yolo. We have about. We have a couple minutes until this thing cuts us off. There's a limit on Instagram Live. I want to play a game with you. It's called Who Would You Call If? I'm going to give you different scenarios. It basically, you know, you're going to pick a person that you've worked with in your NFL career. And that's a lot of personalities, right? From Reggie Bush to Cam Jordan to Doug Marone, who I learned was your offensive coordinator at a given time. Marshall Falk, Tony Romo. Jerry Jones, Drew Brees, Mark Ingram, all of these guys. I'm going to give you scenarios, and you have to tell me which person that you've worked with in the NFL you would call in this situation. In okay? this it's situation. Like a trust game. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Who would you call if you need a fourth in the golf cart? A fourth in the golf cart. Um, Tony Romo. Yeah. He's 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 a fabulous golfer. <laughs> I love that. Eastern Illinois represent. Who would you call if you need somebody to house it for you? To house it. Well, you already volunteer, Kay. All right. And so um, who would I call to house it? Well, Jerry, Jerry has a house about a half an hour from here. So I would call Jerry and let him like send one of his peeps down here to <laughs> To just look at it. <laughs> Jerry? Oh, gosh. This is unbelievable. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> That's, you, I, I, listen, I let one thing slide. Coach Payton, you said Michael when you were referring to Michael Jordan earlier. And I was like, I'll let that slide. But you can't call Jerry. Jerry. Weird. Okay. Who would you call if 
You need a lifeline on who wants to be a millionaire. I need a lifeline. Um, Who's the, listen, smart, the smartest? It's going to be, if I can call two, it's going to be, it's going to be Loomis and Breeze. Yeah. Probably Mickey Loomis. If it's a, if this is, a, we're talking a lifeline here. Yeah. I'm getting, I'm guessing Mickey's going to have the answer. <laughs> Love that. Who would you call if you needed somebody to win a rap battle against Eminem in a basement club? Teron Armstead. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Teron. And I'm right with him. Like, we're going to yeah. do it together. Oh, really? Okay, well, now yeah. I have to see that. Uh, yeah. I have him. He's tremendous. I love Teron Armstead. Too underrated, but kind of a secret weapon, which I like. Okay, who would you call if you needed somebody to win a jump ball in the end zone? Would you call Camp Guard Mike, or would you call Jimmy Graham in his Saints prime? Ooh. Oh, you're killing me. Um, but look, I've seen Jimmy do it, and... I know Mike can do it. <laughs> but I don't want to give the obvious answer still. Okay. All right. So I just want to have, like, we had Keyshawn in Dallas. He, he, uh, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go with Mike in, in the Jordans. Okay. I was going to say that, that's <laughs> Michael Thomas. Of course. Michael yeah. Thomas, final answer. We got it. Okay, that's a tough one. I had to put one in there for you. Uh, who would you call if you had to pick one defensive player to play at wide receiver? One defensive player to play at wide receiver? <sighs> Jason Seahorn was a great, great athlete for us at the Giants. I, I'm going back a ways. Um, I'm going to say, I look, Lattimore could do it. I just don't know if he's going to transition in his routes the right way all the time. Um, he's got to be a receiver, so I'm really at the corner position, maybe the safety position. Um, I think Brian Dawkins, my early, my early years with the Eagles – from Seahorn to Lattimore, and then just that you came out of nowhere with Dawkins. What's happening right now? I'm thinking of like who are the who are the like the most exceptional athletes that I've been a part of that are playing defensive back. Brian Dawkins was a phenomenal athlete. Um, look, pro part of the reason they're playing defensive back is they at some point couldn't catch the ball and they were moved from receiver to DB. Yeah, I hear, so, I hear you. Yeah. So Dawkins. Yeah, I'm going to go with Dawkins. Okay, who would you call if you had to pick an offensive player to line up at cornerback? At cornerback? Um, well, I haven't seen Emmanuel yet, but I know he's got good change of direction. I think this person has to have really, really good feet. Um, in the right system, Lance Moore, I think, would be exceptional. Sure. Um, and then... Um, Devery Henderson had really good speed, and Devery played some running back. He's long. I would I would like his length. So I'm staying in the Saints here when I'm answering this question. Um, yeah, I'll go with Devery. Devery Henderson. I did not think you were going to say that. I like it. Who would you call if you needed somebody to give you a quarantine haircut? Who do you trust that much, Coach? Quarantine haircut. Who would you trust to cut your hair? All right, so the guy I have to give you is my assistant, Kevin Petrie, because he has actually given me two. Um, now, they haven't been fancy. He sets the razor on one inch and just shaves the hair. And we've done these – well, we've done these for um, – one of our secretaries had breast cancer, so that was kind of uh, okay. this past off season. And then a good friend of mine's wife two years ago had breast cancer. So – Fortunately, my hair grows back fast, but Kevin, like right in the middle of the staff room, will pull out the clippers and we'll put a few <laughs> towels down and we go for about a month and a half and it's easy. So you trust him. I love that. That was an easy answer. It's not always easy to answer that. Okay. Who would you call if you wanted to go skydiving? I, I'm going to have to call someone that can help me drink because I, I, I would be, I wouldn't I go skydiving. I would not go skydiving. You wouldn't? 
Oh, no, no. So no are you way. afraid of heights and so snakes? So snakes, snakes and skydiving. Snakes I would, and skydiving. Okay, that's I, I fair. Would, that's I wouldn't fair. be able to jump out of a plane. Well, but that wasn't my question, dear sir. My question was, who would you All call right, who would I call? to go skydiving? I would call, um, it's Steve Gleason. This is such a Gleason. If you knew, okay. like, Steve and his, like, Steve would be the only guy to get you on the plane and then convince you how much fun it's going to be and have like his face painted in black and halfway down in the air, you'd be like, only Steve could have gotten me to do this. That was an easy one. Steve Gleason. I love that. Okay. That's all I've got for you, coach. You did a whole hour on Instagram live. Now are you going to join Instagram? Um, yeah, hopefully it takes a little bit less time than it took me to get logged on here today, but, uh, <laughs> It was nice to be on. I appreciate you having me. Of course. We can set you up. Thank you to Alex with the Saints who sort of uh, navigated this for the two technological boomers uh, on the line here. Coach, you're the best. Thank you so much for hanging out. We're glad you are safe and healthy. And I cannot wait for you guys to win the Super Bowl because I'm. you guys need to make me look smart, okay? This is <laughs> on you. I have, right. <laughs> I have been ride or die for four years for this New Orleans team. And we just we have to make it happen this year. Whatever you need from me, you, you let me know. We will. We appreciate you supporting us. Of course. Thank you so much. Of course, you've got the best fans in the NFL here hanging out with you. You got the thumbs up from Coach Sean Payton. I'm going to kick you out of here now. Don't. Bye. Say bye. All right. Bye. See you. I'm kicked out. <laughs> bye, Coach.